Hey everyone, welcome to the Rainy Lake District. Uh, we're sat in some shelter. I'm Tim Sheaf. Sat here with Josh Ash from Strengthside. Um, we've just been had an amazing weekend. Um, maybe biased. I, I put on a retreat this weekend and with a lot of movement, a lot of nature, mm. swimming, hiking. And there's about 15 beautiful souls came through. Um, my favorite place in the entire world is the English Lake District. And we had a nice place, nice food, just a, a really special time. But it was, uh, my man Josh has, I've seen his journey on YouTube on and off for, for a few years. And it's just great that we kind of, to align with you. And you got into the rope flow a few years ago, or no, a few months ago. A few months ago, yeah. yeah. And, I, and you, I've just seen your progress like that, like you actually did it through the way of the rope yep. programming as well. Yeah. And like week six or seven, you sent me a couple of clips and I was like, man, this guy really gets it. Like, <laughs> and I recognize you from YouTube and then I seen like your email with strength side and I was like, oh mm. yeah. Like, and you, I just remember seeing how strong you looked on your feet mm. and you look really stable. And I, I watched like a foot or ankle strengthening video from you after that. Cause I was like, you obviously have some insight. Like mm. you, you got good, strong feet. What, what, do you, what are your things for that? Mm. Um, and then you kind of just emailed me and you saw that I was hosting a retreat. Yeah. So what, what, how come you felt like, what, what, I guess what drew you to the rope and then what's got you to here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I have, yeah, I followed Tim for a little while off and on. And then, um, you know, it's, it's really funny because I was really attracted to the Lake District. It's somewhere that I thought was just super beautiful and pretty. I'd always wanted to see it. And I then saw a video of Tim in the Lake District doing his thing. And uh, I really like got attracted to the rope because like I just, I thought the way that you were moving with it was so incredibly fluid. And I was just like, there's something there, there's something there. <laughs> I got to start. So like I ordered the ropes, ordered the course and I just got super hooked. And um, I had went through an ankle injury last year and I just felt like I was having a, a hard time like fully recovering from that. Mm -hmm. And like the rope just seemed to give me this like connection to the ground with these slight pivoting motions and like this variation through the ankle that I just wasn't really getting from like mm -hmm. traditional rehab type stuff. Yeah, it's not like monotonous and frequent, but it's, it's like, and it's gentler maybe. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Gentle, and I was still able to, I mean the other side of that is I was still able to find this like flow um, that feels really good for me, uh, with, with still being like quite gentle on the body and, and not super impactful and mm. whatnot. Um, so I remember seeing you say like, you didn't, you felt like you didn't want to be one of those rope flow guys. Yeah. And I completely get that. Yeah. Cause I get how the, how the rope can look to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you felt that, but then you still felt enough of a calling to like, give it a try. Yeah. I mean that, that was like, that, that was definitely a practice of going through my ego a little bit and, uh, <laughs> And, and being like, having a certain like flash judgment of, of a tool or something that like, mm. uh, I, don't, I don't think I need tools, like I can do it all on my own type of thing. <laughs> but then like just, yeah, getting past the ego and being like, no, 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 like there's value here. And then like for 30 days, I, I've heard you talk about like, mm. I just fell in love with it. I did it every day for like almost two months straight. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> But then I started to get into your other stuff, uh, talking about the kettlebell and um, just the stuff that, you know, you've learned from David Weck and getting into uh, yep. the coiling core and yep. head over a foot. And uh, I started doing School of Biomechanics. And at that time, you know, when I saw Tim was like hosting a retreat in the Lake District, I was mm -hmm. like, this is just a lot of synchronicity that I've always wanted to go to the lakes. Yeah. And now I'm getting super into your stuff. and. Uh, and just felt like connected to your journey as well, the yeah. stuff you're going through. Thanks, man. And, yeah. and so the ropes kind of led you to that and almost next minute you're on a Swiss ball, I see like yeah. Yeah. a nice red Swiss ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how was the journey to that? What, 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 Cause that's another one where it's the test of the ego, right? That's the, yeah. the Pilates ball that the women in the gym, women's class will do in the gym. Yeah, or like yeah. the, the strong man isn't touching that. <laughs> <laughs> rubber ball but uh, so how true. was that journey to, to touch that and what made you feel like oh let me give this a shot yeah so uh i had seen you playing with it a bit and um uh, i didn't really have as much hesitation to the ball i thought it actually like looked kind of cool you know like yeah. standing on the ball I'm like this is this is there's something something there once again 
Um, but then I heard your interview with, uh, with David Weck, and um, I told you this earlier this weekend, but when he described, like, when you're off balance, your energy gets sent upwards. and it, it, it's Reflexive like, to go up, right? Right, yeah. and it's more like uh, this sympathetic response of, like, the shoulders move up and, like, you chest breathe, and that ex at least that's my interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. And when you're in balance... And you, you like send the energy down, and you're super you're grounded. Relaxed, or, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're relaxed, and the feet are strong to the ground and whatnot. Um, and that just like really, really clicked with me. And I think <clears throat> I had started to feel a little bit of that through um, doing some like balancing on rails and parallettes and stuff when I was doing a bit of parkour work. And um, but it, but it wasn't <laughs> until I started doing the Swiss ball that I think it's like that 360. It can go in any uh, direction. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it will go to your weakest spots. Mm. Yeah. Yep, yep. And, like, yeah, the weakest spots. So, like, for me, like, the right ankle was the injured one. So I feel myself, like, on the ball, like, Push it yeah. exactly, like, that has to kick on and that has to do it. So just, just like, the, the, the rehab and then the also just, like, the foundation of stability in the body. Mm just ex like huge benefits from it you know yeah like right off the bat yeah it's like another like the rope tells you the truth of your movement patterns mm. if i can mm. turn to the right fine but i'm stiff turning to the left yeah i'm gonna get hit on my left ankle it's telling me that yeah it's helping me move past that it's yep. getting that physical feedback to to move through it the swiss ball is the same thing it's like it's a truth tool yeah if you're weak on one side it's going to show you that and yeah so yeah it, it's it's an ego check or whatever you know it's all yeah that. so that's been beautiful and then i i've seen you you seem to share that philosophy of like stability before strength might be a good thing to think about. Yes, you know? yes, absolutely, yeah. And I think like, so my journey was when I first uh, got done playing sports, like I got into lifting heavy weights because I was like, ah, oh, like, you know, powerlifting, bodybuilding, this is the way, like I wanna get stronger, I wanna get bigger. And uh, I ran into so many injuries um, mm. and I've shared this on strength side quite a bit, but um, really like thing like what got me out of that was starting to do simple things like like dead bugs and like uh, yeah. just like these really simple ways of stabilizing the core better um, and yeah I got like completely out of pain when I stopped uh, like loading myself up with shitty stability basically mm. you know what I mean yeah and then getting on the Swiss ball and and uh, even doing like rope and stuff like that's further just take, taken me in that direction of believing like stability first yeah you know what i mean awesome yeah yeah, yeah. the battery's about to die so i'm just gonna sort the battery's about to yeah die. we got okay. it we got it uh, yeah I, I found similar with the stability work that was mm. it was that aha moment that wet gave me he gave it me with the rope gave me the stability ball it was that we've got that reflexive impulse if we're off balance or something sharp under our feet we've got weak feet we raise all the energy up mm -hmm. and that makes it we're more likely to fall and lose balance then and yeah. if we can test that in a in that goldilocks zone where it's not too easy to balance but it's not too hard yeah then we can train that reflex to be to soften into it rather than to harden yeah um and the swiss ball is great because you can vary the size of the swiss ball or yeah. you can just kneel on it we don't stand on it straight away i don't i don't think many of the i think most of the benefits with the swiss ball come from kneeling and sitting, sitting and then hinging really yeah. and it just yeah. helps one, one of the main things i found was in a lot of biomechanical practices they talk about getting into the posterior chain into the back chain mm -hmm. and the conventional 90s method is like just do deadlifts and right. you know there is a place for deadlifts but they won't make someone suddenly start using their posterior chain yeah. loads better it might help a bit but with a stability ball it's it's helping us anchor efficiently i think so when yeah. we're kneeling on it and we're hinging it wants us to anchor and it starts us to, as it says, it goes to our weaknesses. So if our weakness is our back chain, it will go towards that and it will, the body will find the more efficient method. And so it's the way I program it. And you, I don't know if you found that you worked it the same was just to put a timer on five minutes or seven yeah. minutes or a song or listen to something yeah. and spend a lot of time in one position yeah. until you felt ready to move on. Is yeah. that kind of how you did it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. yeah Rather than I, it's not like sets and reps of squats or something, right? Absolutely. It's more like put a timer on or yeah, like put a song on. I enjoy doing that. And then you just, yeah, play in that position. And yeah. I really liked like the variation of like kneeling, doing some half kneeling with like mm. one leg up. One leg up yeah. That seemed to like bring out some different li little weak points and, and whatnot. And 
essentially that's what you're doing, right? Like you're searching for yeah. these places where you feel unstable and then just trying to relax into it and hopefully become more stable. Hang out and then, yeah. and you get these shakes, we call it like tremors or whatever. Yeah. And that's that core weakness I find or instability. Yeah. And that's what I experienced was when I would do this for three, four, five sessions, each session I'd get slightly less intense shakes mm. until, it, until I didn't have any shakes anymore in those yeah. positions. And that's when I felt like, every joint felt like it had more of a 360 strength. I don't mm. know, that's one I've just thought of it to explain. I don't know how, yeah. to, you know, something yeah. like that. It felt, because you've been tested in 360, uh, I felt, especially my knees, you know, kind yeah. of, I felt a lot stronger in there. Yep. Um, so that stability, and as opposed to like slack line is a great practice and mm -hmm. parallettes, but it's, I think slack line, I kind of call it 2D. You've got here and here, yeah. but you've not got like the front and back as much. Right, right. And the, the parallette is good because that stays fixed, but kind of 1D, uh -huh. and then you move around that. But the Swiss ball is the opposite end of the spectrum where that will move every way. And yeah. then you've also got the left and right kind of connection where if my right foot lifts up, my left foot's going to sink down to stay balanced yeah. and the opposite way around. So there's that, a whole, that's a whole extra part of the coordination that's happening because the way the left hemisphere controls the right leg and the right hemisphere controls the left leg, there's just that brain harmonizing and there's just so many things to it that yeah. like, you can explain it or look at science to the blue in the face, but when you try it, it just feels good. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. And I think there's a level of um, the nervous system starting to re relax and, and downregulate a bit in positions that you like maybe first thought were quite scary and mm. had a reaction to, oh shoot, like, like this reaction, you know, that we talked about earlier. Mm. Um, and then being able to breathe through uh, into, yeah, into these positions, yeah. Mm. And then from that, um, I feel like the, again, that we, we, we've talked about a lot this trip, but this both sides utilize philosophy that Weck, David Weck, who founded the Bosu ball, which is the half Swiss ball. Yeah which he discovered or he invented because he fell off a Swiss ball and thought it was quite, quite clever. Yeah. And BOSU stands for both sides utilized using the right side and the left side. But it's also a philosophy that transcends to all of our training. So it's like, it's the bilateral training. It's like the deadlift bilateral, but then you want to train unilateral coiling or whatever. You yeah. know, it's, it's, we always want to think about, it's, it's not just pronation, it's supination, you know? Right. And, and it's, it's all those things. It's not just supination, pronation. Um, it's not just back chain, it is front chain as well. You know, right. It's not all just that. You want to strengthen, you, it's not just anterior pelvic tilt, it's posterior pelvic tilt, but it's not just, you know. There's all yeah. these systems that get stuck on this one body position that you need to hammer into the body, uh -huh. and, not, and they don't want to focus on, if my body's able to go there, I should strengthen it, like strengthen right. every position. Almost. Right, right, yeah. Um, but then with the Swiss ball, it, it feels like we're not having to overthink, mm -hmm. we're not trying to strengthen every position consciously, the body's doing the work. Mm. We're just setting up the parameters for the body to reorganize itself kind of thing. So right. You felt like that was happening, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like you're putting conscious effort into one posture mm. or one position or one side. Mm. It's like you just have to get on the thing and then just, just spend the time there. Ride it out. <laughs> and that's what's kind of nice is it's yeah. like, yeah, you, you, it doesn't take so much conscious effort. Mm. Um, just just putting the time in mm. yeah and so the opposite end of that of this big round rubber ball mm -hmm. and i love spheres there's something to do with spheres in like spiritually yeah. physically whatever <laughs> is this dense metal sturdy you know that's unstable a very stable metal ball uh -huh. of a kettlebell yeah <laughs> yeah right. so what was your journey into kettlebells from like when did you first ever discover kettlebells and yeah first uh Red kettlebell sinister by Cause, Pavel. Because like. that's just just that's something we're loving right now, right? Uh -huh. We're really loving kettlebells. So. Yeah, yeah. Tim's reignited my my interest in kettlebells. I, I first got into them a long time ago, probably like eight nine years ago. Um, but I don't think I was in a place to to understand it as much. I was Same. more so using it on like my off days from like heavy lifts, like deadlifts and, mm. and squats. And I was like, oh, this is like a recovery tool or something. Mm. I didn't see that it was like its own practice that was gonna mm. actually probably create a lot like stronger foundation in me. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, so like you've reintroduced me to that in the, the uh, School of Biomechanics, but also doing things that haven't practiced before, like the, for instance, like the walking one arm swing um, mm. stuff like that, that just like feels so, so right. Yeah. 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 This rotational and movement. The rotational movement. And it's kind of 
like the next step after the rope. So we call the rope yeah. in the Swiss ball for me like a rite of passage. Yeah. You put your time in and it unlocks these patterns that you can then play with a heavier object. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we're finding with the kettlebell, right? It's like yep. we're doing these swings, but it's not just bilateral, both sides exactly the same. It's the coiling, the rotation uh -huh. to make it happen. And for me, this was the, a big realization was the, how the tensegrity of the body works, which is we've got the fascial system over the muscles, then you've got the tendons and the ligaments, and we want that all to work together. Yeah. A lot of strength training, and not, not your type, but a lot of mainstream conventional strength training, is just the muscles or isolated muscles. And yeah. there is a place, there's both sides utilize philosophy. There's a place for training isolation. There's also yeah. a place for training sequencing and togetherness with the body. And the, the what, one thing when I, when I started to train these rotational patterns I got from David Weck, from Weck Method, and what the rope helped to program into my body, having used it as a rite of passage, I'm then doing the same patterns but with weight. And, that, and to make the weight move, I'm using more tensegrity than, than muscle. I'm using more of an even balance mm. of muscle and tendons and ligaments rather than just muscle. And mm. it's quite easy with bilateral motions to just get into muscles to make things happen. Yeah. With the rotational work with the kettlebell, it's, it can be dangerous if you're using a heavy weight and you're not those patterns on ingrained. Yeah. But with the lightweight, it's quite safe to start playing with these movements. Yeah, exactly. And grease the groove, as Pavel would say. And as that starts to, as we start to find these set like matrix lines to function on, or functional on functional movement, I, I think we can claim that. You can start to add the weight. Yeah. And then it gets pretty funny. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The way I've been conceiving a lot of it lately is is. Um, like uh, bilateral movement is usually doesn't involve much shifting of your weight, um, mm. but like human movement in any capacity of athletics or even just like like standing up off this bench right here, <laughs> yeah. like it all has to do with shifting weight. And this is like this this balance within movement and this fluidity within movement, and uh, it just makes so much sense to me. To, to train that, right? And like, I, I think mm -hmm. what, what like WEC, uh, what they're doing is like, the ratio should actually be more of this rotational shifting weight. And then you can still use the bilateral stuff to get stronger just overall. Yeah. But like, you have to integrate that into the functional stuff, the stuff that's actually gonna be functional to your day-to-day -day life and your sports and, yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, and the two, the two main things, back to bringing it back to Pavel, and you said you got introduction was simple and sinister. Yeah. Right? yeah. Eight, uh -huh. nine years ago. And that's what reignited it for me was yeah. I, I got into kettlebells a few years ago. And I remember hearing of the simple and sinister program, which is just the two most functional movements of a, that a human needs. Getting up from the floor. Every yeah. day you get out of bed, right? Most people don't have to get up. They, half the body goes down, half the body goes up. Uh, you know what I mean? Because yeah. their bed's at hip height. But yeah. if you live on the floor, you have to get up every day out of bed. <laughs> so that's one thing you do. One of the hardest things you do is get out of bed every day half of the program is getting up out of bed with a heavy weight. The other half is a hinge yeah. with a kettlebell. Yeah. And it has, I mean, there's so many avenues to go with this, but just the kettlebell swing, anyone that's dug into it, they know that it's called the what the heck effect, where you just swing a bell and you get stronger everywhere. I remember my experience was my press-ups, I didn't train press-ups and suddenly I could bang out twice as many as before without ever training them because mm. of just swinging a kettlebell. Yeah. There's that ballistic nature of fingertip to toe tip everything is, is, the balance is being challenged as you're lifting this heavy weight. And it could be a 24 kilo kettlebell, but when you're swinging, that's not 24 kilos because it's got centrifugal force and mm, all sorts. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot softer on the joints. So you've got the hip hinge, which is the human walking motion of the glute, driving the, you know, the hip to move forward for us to walk. And then you've got the Turkish get up, which is getting up off the floor with a heavy ass weight in your hand, like above your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and one of the, my favorite quotes from Pavel, and I'm paraphrasing is that, heavy weight in, is instructive. Mm. And so what, what we've learned, or I've learned with the Turkish getup, and I think we, we played with it on the retreat, we did it most days, we got the Turkish yeah. getup in. Because as you're able to understand the technique and, and the, the few steps of transitions with the Turkish getup, and you're able to up the weight, it really teaches you how to, we call it bone stacking, how to stack the bones to, to do the weight. So we're not only relying on muscle to get the weight up there, mm -hmm. We're starting to understand balanced positions and postures, whether we're lying, whether we're on our side, whether we're on one knee, we're still able to, to use as much of the skeleton structure to support the weight. And then we use the muscles and rotation around that to, to get yeah. it up there. Yeah. And so it's so educational for the body. And yeah. again, it's like the rope where you just got to do a few reps every day and yeah. it gets smoother and you don't have to overthink it, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. what you, you've enjoyed that this weekend? Like, oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and you know it's interesting. It's like uh, so I, like I know, I know we're the same age, and yeah, it, it, it's like you can rely on um, like using your muscles and not stacking your phones for for a lot of your youth. Very but true. you get to a point where like you want you want efficiency over anything else and i think like these are the practices that lead to longevity and like i know we both want to be able to do this stuff for a long long time and, yeah. and be able to go out and walk up a mountain and and, and go for long walks and stuff and um absolutely so, so yeah like it, i think everyone at, what i see from a lot of people that i work with is you get to a certain age where okay like now it's time to like be a little bit smarter with my training and that's exactly what I what I get from like the kettlebell and like the Turkish get up like such a simple thing that maybe doesn't look so so sexy in some circles but like gives you so much more than yeah other things do I think I really didn't understand it when I first tried it yeah and it wasn't until I put the reps in and built the weight up that I started to feel like I needed to pee in the night and I got up to go to the bathroom and I just popped up yeah. Because I've been doing it with 20 kilos in my hand, it made it a lot easier. Even though yeah. I'm obviously tired, I couldn't just do it in the middle of the night with the weight, but it just made those, those things easier. And it, and it was once I started to embrace unilateral training, the more of the one-sided training, uh -huh. and recognize there's potential in that. Because on the surface, the, I guess, we want to look... We, when you're younger in training, I think, when you're just more youthful, yeah. and you're not quite as deeply invested in biomechanical stuff before you start to understand it more, the, unit, the bilateral, the, the rigid robotic stuff makes more sense to you. Yeah. Because it's simpler and whatever. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. But getting up, like, you, wanna, you can do two-handed Turkish get-ups and it feels like, oh, you're doing a crunch and then you're standing up, you're doing a squat. Right. But then the unilateral stuff, you don't quite understand it. But once you start to play with it, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm getting as coiled as I can on this side to drive in. Yeah. I'm doing a, this, this hip hinge from here to, to stand up. Well, I guess it's this way. And it's like what that's doing on one side of my body to open that, the QL up, right? A lot of us, have, for me, I've had a big left side QL issue and it was doing the Turkish get with a light weight because if you just do a normal deadlift, the QLs, they're both at, the, at that same side and we're not learning to stabilize, but once you stretch one side out and you compress on the other, all the muscles around it start to kick in and start to help stabilize. Yeah, so yeah. it was the unilateral training and it's movements like this where you do it at a slow place and you, pace and you tune into your body that started to fix a lot of those niggles because I was doing so much bilateral stuff. Like yeah. My history with parkour is a lot of two-handed jump, right. two-footed, two-handed jumps, right. so much bilateral stuff. Yeah. And so it was getting into the unilateral training that started to, to, started to heal a few things, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like if you look at origins of, of movement, like you have your, your, your crawling and like your hanging slash swinging, mm. right? And like, yep. Both of those are so much built in one side elongating and one side shortening, right? Totally. Coiling core. Yep. Um, and yeah, the, like for me, those are like these primal foundational movement patterns that like, I don't know if you can just do those. Like I think like we've evolved to, you know, be upright and like that's why these things like the Turkish get up, like, um, you know, like uh, lunging and, and whatnot like this is really important to us as humans but like that we have to look to these the, these uh to our past to our evolutionary past mm -hmm. and we move like this you know yeah. uh, so so like i think anybody will find a lot of benefit in it i'm starting to just think this way yeah and starting to play with just a couple patterns in this yeah. way um and then it's just been fun to kettlebell is still so young and there's like hard style and competition style, mm. but then there's this whole WEC method style evolving with it. We were just sat mm. watching it, some Instagram, yeah. showing each other some Instagram people that we look up to and like the way yeah. they use it. People like Chris Chamberlain and, and a few other guys. And it's just so impressive and it looks so athletic. Yes. It's like strength yeah. training squared or something, you know, it's, like, yeah, it's just yeah. a new, there is a new wave of biomechanical training. And there is like an absolute uh, land grab, it feels like right now, on, in the online space to be the biomechanical and like pioneers mm. isn't there there's a lot of different movements mm -hmm. claiming a lot of different big benefits and whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and everyone's got the benefits and negatives you know and there was just something with work method that it, it was separate from the rest of the field mm. in the in their approach to stuff and it was pattern yeah. training you know yeah and it was it was much more nuanced and precise and it wasn't so focused the hit this, this was the, the journey I had to go on separate from the WEC method stuff, it was like, if you have a functioning body, like, you can then build on that and be really athletic. Yeah. But there was a few things missing because they don't focus so much on the balance stuff. It's more the, like, 
the, the you've already got the athletic body. Let's build on it. Yeah. Let's train the patterns. You, yeah. And they use simple tools to do it with the the pulses and the ropes. Yeah. So that's what kind of led me to the Swiss ball was looking at David Wett. Well, he's already got a functioning body to, to then excel from with the work method stuff. Right, right. And it was digging into that that led me to the Swiss ball to go. Oh, he's put his time in on this, and he's yeah. openly shared that to get me there. But there's the work method stuff. It's not claiming to like fixed posture and all this stuff. it's yeah. not claiming all these benefits yeah. it's just a fun way to train yeah and it's open to it there's just certain um like the coiling core and the rotational movement and this infinity path those are like just principles that you can start to think about and you can run with it you know they're mm. just david's just giving it to everyone if mm -hmm. you want to use their equipment you can if you don't want to use it that's it he's absolutely fine with that you know? yeah yeah, yeah right. and it, it, he's just got a certain attitude that's quite rare within this space and i think they do they they're foundational separate from the other systems. And the other systems are kind of there to help people get to a, a place of foundational strength and like no injuries and stuff. But I just, I don't know, it's just, a, it's just an interesting time in this space. Yeah. And I think the next five years of like which systems stick and if systems can come together and like share the best of best, yeah, it, yeah. it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, I've, I think I've, I've heard people use the, use like the analogy or phrase of like zero to, there's zero to one and then there's like one to two. Oh, and like that's zero right. to one is like, you know, get like finding safety in your body, getting out of pain, um, developing a certain level of like ground, foundational strength and stability. And then that one to two is like, let's stack athleticism and performance on top that's, of it. That's, I haven't heard that, but that's exactly it. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, I think like for you that you're trying, you're, I think like you're finding like with the stability ball, the Swiss ball, it's like, that's, that's kind of zero to one, that's right? Ground zero. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. ground Cause zero. Cause I was trying to do one to two and the rope was fun, but there were still some niggles I was dealing with. Yeah. It doesn't, the rope doesn't just fix everything. Right? right, right. And I had some ankle issues that the stability ball was able to fix. Yeah. Get me to that one. And now one to two is looking a lot, it's feeling and looking a lot more fun. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I was able to start developing the kettlebell stuff that we're, that we're doing. Yeah. And, and so, so, question for you, how, um, so you've had a long journey of injuries and, and uh, mm. <laughs> all types of stuff, right? Emotional yeah. work as well. But yeah. like, how is the current state feeling for Tim Sheaf. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd say compared to 20 year old Tim, I don't feel as bulletproof or I can't yeah. move without with as little inhibition, but I am more more mobile. Yeah. And I do feel way more functional, mm. but there's just still that like that young zest that, that I don't feel yet, but I sure. feel like I'm actually still heading in that direction. Yeah. Like I feel the best I've felt in maybe 6 7 years. Wow. Physically? Yeah. Um enjoying the training more than I have since my parkour days. So probably in like seven, eight, ten years, something like that. Wow. This kettlebell stuff that we, this weekend was the most enjoyable training I've had. And I yeah. feel like we're just getting started with yeah. it, you know. Yeah. I, want, I wanted like a week. And I'm, I, I, oh, it, was just so, it was so fun to just do this stuff. Everyone on the Swiss ball and make it fun, you know. Yeah. We, we played games with the Swiss ball. So it wasn't just, when you're at home, you just put the time, put like you say, put a song on. But when you're together sure. in a group, you can interact, play catch on the Swiss ball. Yeah, and different yeah. games. And then we go into the kettlebell, we do the walking kettlebells and you've got lines of people just like walking on, walking on, doing these patterns yeah. and we're just drilling certain patterns and we'll do a press pattern. And, yeah. and so yeah, just doing that for myself felt great at home and then having this as an outlet to share it with other people and having that like imposter syndrome of maybe just I enjoy it. You know? uh, maybe yeah. I'm going to force this onto other people yeah. and they're not going to have fun here. Yeah. And then to see actually people did enjoy it and yeah. it, it was a, like... And I think everyone's got, everyone's wants to get it. Who doesn't have a kettlebell already wants to get a set of kettlebells. And, yeah, right. And it, it, like I said earlier, it's just such early days for that. Well, well, also a testament to the rope. Like it was, it was crazy to have so many people into the rope. And True. like we're chilling at like a lake for a nice swim, and then all of a sudden everybody has their rope out. Yeah, yeah. And everybody's flowing together. I'm like the last one with my rope out. I'm yeah. like just chilling. <laughs> I look around and everyone is roping. Right, and, right. Yeah, and that is like really heartwarming to see. Like, oh, because. It's lonely when you're like onto things relatively early and you connect with them and, and because the internet's such a weird like spread out community where there's no real like pockets of places where mm. no one in Derby is really into the rope. So mm. I've been doing it on my own for years or in Bristol. Yeah. And a few people would get into it, but like to have that come together and realize, oh, we, like there is something really good about this. It's not just my own imagination. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's really cool. And I think it's a, it's a testament to um, to that tool, like making you feel so good on so many different levels, you know, mm. physically and uh, emotionally. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. spiritually, whatever it is. Yeah. But yeah, on that note, I guess, because 
we have talked a lot of biomechanics, yeah. but I think we've both come to places in our life where we realize it's not just about the body and the biomechanics. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's been, to be honest, that's been the majority and that's probably been the most, aside from the physical movement, the most enjoyable conversations we've had and the deeper conversations yeah. have been about recognizing the emotional work that kind of needs to be done alongside the biomechanics if we actually want to grow, I don't know, I guess in love maybe a bit, uh, seeming like an extreme word, but grow to, to some people depending on where they're at. But because it's all fun to, like I've won that world, free running world championships and stuff, but yeah. I never felt any more full from it. Yeah. That only benefits me, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, it doesn't yeah. benefit anyone else. Whereas this kind yeah. of practices that can help other people physically, but then the emotional work is like, that's what actually where I actually feel a difference in my life. I didn't yeah. feel like I won a world championship and I felt happier for anything that wasn't just addictive and f facade yeah. emotions. It was yeah. all ego, right? Whereas when I do s emotional work, I actually feel a shift and like a natural state of happiness yeah. becomes slightly more apparent. You yeah. know? And so yeah. I know I, it's interesting trying to enter this conversation about emotional work. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, well, I, I think... Uh, for, for me, like I'll, I'll share just like a little bit of my, sure. my story with, uh, with you know, with strength side becoming more and more successful, mm -hmm. and like you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, like six years ago, I would have been so so happy to have uh, twenty thousand subscribers on YouTube, and now all of a sudden, I'm in this place where there's eight hundred thousand subscribers, and I'm like, mm. this is like a extremely successful channel, and um, and then I was also at this place where I was really starting to like push my physical limits and I was starting to just like do calisthenic skills and um, like learning how to do flips and, and just the stuff that was like, like I was like almost like blowing myself away with, with uh, how, how much like external success I was starting to have. Achieving things that you thought you wanted to achieve. Exactly, yeah. right. But... I was at a like a pretty big low and internally it made no internally difference. yeah I was like this isn't making me any more happy like you said and mm. for me like actually having an ankle injury was it, it put me like into a, a really big low and a depression mm. but I started to understand that like just pushing myself more and more and like trying to become more successful it wasn't helping anybody else out like if I can do flips, how does that help anybody on strength side? That that like, yeah. you know. Yeah, and it, it's not to say flips are bad, but it's just like exactly when you make that everything. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and like and, and like if your your identity is getting mixed up in that. Like, yeah. So like for me and, and yeah exactly it's not to say like I know you're not saying that. Yeah, yeah like yeah like I I love like push the boundaries that that's that's awesome. Yeah. But for me it was like a big like coming back to myself moment where I was like you know what like. I actually love just getting better at the basics and it felt really fell in line with getting in to your stuff in like this this humble practices humble as practices. you say right yeah, like yeah. the rope and and Swiss ball and kettlebell and just like truth tellers that are like yeah, humbly, yeah and yeah. that anybody can pick up quickly um, and like that kind of brought me like I said brought me back to myself a little bit and uh, I started to understand like oh wow like I've been really closed off to my emotions and I've been just go 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 and achieve all these things and that's gonna get me to where I want to be didn't do any of that and the only thing that's made me feel more comfortable in this life is just like processing the emotions feeling what needs to be felt and yeah yeah like starting that journey it's mm -hmm. like I feel like we're just like I said earlier we're at the foot of that mountain, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cross the desert to realize that that's the, the chasing achievements and success isn't truly satisfying in the soul, I think. Yeah. And that, like, I think we've always, there's some element of me and you in our last few years, especially of, like, trying to be of service. Mm -hmm. But still, like, for me, there's, there's a point when I'm trying to help other people because I'm scared to feel my own pain. Mm. And so it's like helping other people out of pain because I'm scared to actually just face yeah. my own yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's that, trying to that, find that balance of, okay, definitely like trying to be of service and help share good education is important, but then it's also no good if I'm still not helping myself and yeah. healing myself yeah, and yeah, working yeah, yeah. through my emotions. And the only real, there's like two types of healing, I think. There's like 
physical healing where you're not just addictively at the gym and you've got a knee injury that you're not addressing and you're just still pushing through because yeah. you're addicted to the endorphins that come when you get a PB or whatever right. whatever it is and or when you when you're sweating really common so yeah so it's like there's there's healing the body finding the holistic practices that aren't over demanding I think like the Swiss ball and that can kind of heal the body to a degree but the 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 body is so connected to for my the definition is the soul and the emotions are what gets stored in the soul so there's mm. I, I wouldn't say I had like a traumatic childhood, but to a little innocent child, a parent that still shuts you in your room or, or disciplines you with anger or controls you with fear, with, yeah. with anger and fear, it's still traumatic. It gets stored. It gets stored, yeah. right? And that's what I'm coming to realize is it gets stored and that manifests in a lot of injuries in the body, yeah. right? So yeah. as, I, as I started to recognize certain relationships with my father, and I think we have some similarities in this, and mm -hmm. I, I felt more warmth and support and love from my dad when I achieved success athletically so therefore, a lot of my life has been shaped by that without only realizing that recently that I've achieved, I've, I've striven for athletic success. Yeah. And looking at little things like the right side of the body is masculine, and the left side connected to the feminine. So my right ankle issue might be something to do with me trying to strive for success to prove something to my father. And my body is saying, this isn't a healthy venture. And after yeah. it can only do it for a certain amount of time before the, the law of attraction, whatever, builds and builds. And it's like, you need to address the emotional reason for why you're doing this because you're not yeah. loving other people with what you're sharing if your motives aren't loving because yeah. you just want to be seen as a, as a good athlete and that only serves you, you know. Right. So there's so many things it ties to, but trying to reverse that process, we, I think we've learned to like not express emotions from childhood, from the way our, our, our parents didn't express emotions or didn't allow us to yeah. and try to, I don't know, just because this is a whole podcast and it's all like a whole yeah. 10 <laughs> episodes. But I think just, yeah, like you say, from your, your journey of starting to recognize that and me the same, it's like starting to actually work through emotions with the help of whatever you can have a counselor. For me, I, I like the teachings of divine truth. They've helped me a lot to understand myself. And I feel like I've actually made some progress in the yeah. last year yeah. where I actually feel slightly happier. And it's not because yeah. I've suddenly got any more money or anything like that. It's completely just tied to my own natural state like a child is happy for no reason yeah and i think we can get to that yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, it, and i feel like i've actually made an, a slight bit of progress and i've cried more in the last year than i've cried in any of my adulthood life yeah you know yeah. and, and I, there's it's a lot of nuance but i feel like it's an important conversation right? yeah 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 i can really relate because um uh i think like w we had a conversation that where i kind of was like this idea of like, are you actually um, suffering less and are you mm. becoming more happy? And like, you really have to like be real with yourself <laughs> to ask these questions because a lot. So the question that I think you have to be really real with yourself to like yeah. ask, like, are you actually suffering less and are you actually becoming happier? And yeah. we can we can give ourselves the facade that that we are moving into more happiness, more positiveness. But uh, a lot of the time, when you look at like the long term, like you're, you're actually not. And that's what I found for myself for a long time. Definitely same. Yeah. And like just relating to you in this past uh, half year, actually, I've, I've cried more times than I have in my whole adult life. And I could say at this point in my life, like I am, f I'm feeling um, more happy, more wonder, more curious, more, uh, like just um, free, I guess, in myself to mm. to be myself um, and to not let like my self consciousness and my traumas and my injuries kind of run my my life so much. Yeah. Uh, and I think that like the main thing that I've found is just trying to go through the emotions, feel the emotions. Like it's so much harder to do. It's so much easier <laughs> to distract and push through anything yeah. that and comes up. And chase physical goals and things. And chase, yeah, yeah. Material, right. Materiality, yeah. 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 It's, and, I, and I just want to be clear because it's not just, because it is certainly mostly like this crying is a big issue for men and mm -hmm. talking about that and being vulnerable like that. But I've also expressed a lot of anger in a healthy way mm. that, was, that has helped me get to the crying. Mm. Just if someone's like, I'm trying to cry, trying to cry, like there might be the men out there. And for me, there was a lot of anger at my mother that I needed to, that I didn't recognize, because you're like, oh, well, my mother just did her best. There's a lot of societal pressure to love our parents. Yeah. And if we don't feel it in our heart, then, it's, then we're lying to ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, on some level, yes, I love my mother, but right, on some level, I'm still angry at my mother's control over me. Hmm. And so to be humble with that and not to project it at her, 
but to just be in my bedroom or whatever or with a, with a, some punching a punching bag and some gloves and to just feel let that that rage that's within me and I want to this is one thing that's been really huge for me is depression is often is in most cases repressed anger mm. so if someone is suffering from depression They've probably got anger and we can really be, a lot of people can be really deceitful with themselves and it's so buried that they don't know they're angry. Mm. And so if you are suffering with that, look, and you, you might just need to get some, uh, some punching glo bu gloves in a bag and just to go through the motions and scream and you might yeah. catch, catch like a, sp a spark catching fire. Oh, there is rage there. Yeah. Go through that. And then after you get work through some of that anger, there might be sadness. You might drop in and I've done this when I'm dropping, I'm crying. Yeah. after I've expressed that rage. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, it's, so there's different ways. There's some sadness for sadness. There is just crying to be done. And there's also some anger that's a capping emotion. Well, there's depression, capping anger, capping sadness. Yeah. So the, the soul works in layers. Like it's, it is it's, it's soul mechanics, I like mm. to call it, because there is a whole uh, a thing to it. So I think that's, that's one thing I just wanted to share because it, there's the crying and there's, there's often a lot of, especially with males, there's a lot of anger that we might need to work through as well. Yeah, one that I've used is like uh, screaming into the pillow. Yeah, you know, like, same. <sighs> yeah, and because uh, it, it is like a, it, it, it's it's more of an aggressive emotion, and it, it can be a little bit. Um, it's like you feel judged for expressing. For expressing, yeah, that. And yeah. We judge ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. If you have like a roommate in the other room, like it might just feel a little bit. <laughs> like I remember seeing someone do it when I didn't understand this path. Yeah, and I had weird feelings about them afterwards. Right, right. And now I recognize they were just much more in touch with it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, but you know, there's, there's ways that I think you can get comfortable with it. Maybe it is like going out in the woods, taking a walk and like being able to be alone and express that anger or whatever. But mm. um, I agree, I agree. It's yeah. very so, powerful. So I wanted to ask then, hmm. did you, when you have worked through any emotions, have you noticed any shifts in your body? Yeah, well, so physically, like shifts in my body, like I think I, just a bit more relaxed and like mm. I think the nervous system down regulating because yeah. it affects the organs and everything right mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah right right and uh, I guess more on the like <laughs> the motivations of things side uh, yeah. like that's where I've really felt like oh wow like I've I had this goal of say like getting like five handstand push-ups and like where's that Where's that coming from? Like, why do I need that? And like, why do I yeah. feel so attached to that? And like, being able to just drop a lot of that yeah. and be like, that's that's not gonna move me forward in any way. And we were know? talking about like through hikes and stuff, right? Like, I uh -huh. want to do the Pennine Way, and I think you want to do the PCT. Yeah, yeah. And I had like a few years ago, it was really like, I need to do that goal. Like, when I fix my ankles, uh -huh. I'm gonna go and do that. Yeah. And now I feel like my ankles are much better and probably capable of doing it. But I've also worked through some emotions. I don't feel drawn to do it because yeah. it might have just been a running away from all my issues, I just want to go and have no responsibility for two weeks, three weeks, you know. Exactly. And do this feat, so it is, yeah, yeah that's a big shift. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, and the another one for me is, um, is like I've always identified with being more of an introvert and, uh, and, and needing my solo time to gain my energy back up and everything, but the more I've, I've released some emotions and done some emotional work, like the more I feel like that actually, I actually not so sure if, if that, if that is the way that I actually am, like that's a cover up, I think. I know exactly, yeah, yeah. And like, like I'm feeling too like, yeah. overwhelmed and I feel like I need to retreat and then like regain myself and come back. But now I'm feeling like, oh, I can just like process this with people and I don't have to go be like a hermit for a while. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I, the same thing. I got a tattoo of a wolf because I like being like a lone wolf sometimes, mm. you know? And then I'm like, oh yeah, what's that? Like, yeah. And, and that, like, like you, like this retreat, this, I've been able to be around 20 people and be perfectly comfortable mm. and be open and free and be myself as, as much as I can be. Mm -hmm. um, and like before I would have been like, I wanted my, wanted my own space more of the time. And it's like, we've been literally around each other from waking to sleeping like most days. Yeah, yeah. It's been really, really eye-opening to just be able to have these moments to notice the growth in, yeah. in the work that we're trying to put in. And then just realize there's still so much ahead, but it's but the hope, there's hope I feel now. Mm. The emotional work has given mm. me hope, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because before it felt like a lot of emptiness and dead ends. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. I hit a really low point where I remember I was laying in bed one morning and I was just like feeling like so blocked up. And I was like, I was like, if I think if I don't fix this, then like I could come down with some type of like 
disease or ailment or something. Yeah. You know, those are the things that eat at you and yeah. and cause those manifest types of, in an organ cancer right. or something. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and you so, recognize that like early. You know, most people aren't taught to think that way. Or yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. If, yeah, I guess it was early on the grand scheme of things. And yeah. but I just yeah, relating to you on the hope. Like I, I now I'm like feeling like. I know how to deal with this and mm. and uh yeah i'm like super excited for right now and for the future and yeah yeah wicked is there anything that you, like you recommend that helped you like a movie or any resource that you go to mm, for for like the emotional stuff is there anything that helps stuff. you yeah like because the... for me i can watch some movies that help me get into stuff mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, or then yeah. there's, there's like a book um the body never lies is one that i'm reading at the moment the body never lies. Yeah, which is a lot about like a repressed childhood traumas okay. and recognizing that and actually the truth of that because we can have these ailments and issues and injuries and physical problems that manifest because our body's not lying to us. It knows the truth of what happened, but we're yeah. lying in it. We don't know the truth in the head or we won't yeah. admit the truth of our childhood or whatever it is. Yeah. And it's once you make the connection, things start to change from that moment. Yeah. Once you actually are truthful with yourself, or actually, I am mad at my parent or I did... That, that did hurt me when that happened and we not just there's a lot of spiritual bypassing goes on where we try and like just say oh let it go it's and that's good. and it, yeah it's yeah, all good and when, yeah. we, when we don't actually feel that in our heart and yeah, our soul yeah. and we say that there's a lie there's a deception and the body will tell you the truth of it but in our head we're just de 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 deceptive and so that that's one book i'd recommend is the body never the body never lies um, yeah. i don't know if you had one yeah well just on that point like i i, I think i i used to be a little bit more into surrender to life and mm -hmm. like that being positive like the mentality, way, and positive mentality, yeah. And um, and now, like I still think that there's a little bit of value in um, in being able to surrender in certain experiences because you don't have control of what's going on outside of you, but like you have to feel what's coming up for you, like that that and that's been so big for me. And yeah, you do. Yeah. And and yeah, just in to the answer moment your question, coming up, like yeah. right, right. Yeah. And to answer your question, like. I'm definitely not an expert on, on the emotional work, but what what works well for me is, uh, yeah, I have like a playlist of kind of sad, I don't know if they're sad songs, but they're songs that make me feel emotional or sad. And, yeah. and I put my headphones on and a lot of the time I like to have like a blindfold on. Um, and I'll just think back of, of memories when I was a kid that uh, things that were scary or painful and uh it's some, always childhood stuff will come back yeah. a lot of the time it's childhood yeah. stuff yeah and sometimes like i'm able to just really just go straight into it and maybe feel emotions and, and cry sometimes not so much but uh it's it's that's become my that's kind of take the place of meditation for me that practice <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah so yeah 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 i didn't even yeah Exactly. It is. It is a, and, it, and like you say, we actually did that, didn't we? we experimented this weekend. I, I made a Saturday evening. We did something I called the emotional disco. Yeah. And I got every guest or, or friend, whatever it is, to like send me a song that would that gets them into emotions, whether it's like anger or rage or sadness or grief, whatever it was. Something that triggers something could be from a breakup they had yeah. or from a movie they like or a sad movie. And everyone sent me one song. We put in a, a, a Spotify playlist and we hit shuffle. And it was really awkward <laughs> to begin with. But like the first three or four yeah, songs, yeah. Like there was only like one of the guy would start dancing and I was and like, I tried to get involved. Kind of sitting there, yeah, yeah, but then by the end of it, there's a few people start popping off. Like, oh, yeah. And we didn't really say who each person's song was, but uh -huh. it meant someone's crying in the corner. And, yeah. and your song came on and I saw you were in some feelings yeah. as well. And yeah, yeah, yeah. What was your song? Uh, no Hard Feelings by... No hard feelings. Uh, Avid Brothers. Avid Bro Brothers. Yeah, Brothers. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, because like, when you yeah. sent it me, I listened to it. So I then I knew when it came on again. I already mine. had that. I knew it was yours, but yeah. I also had like second. Because the first oh, listen, yeah. you don't quite connect as much, right? Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I felt it a lot more, and I saw you and your feelings, and yeah. I was like, yeah, this is a deep song. Like it's quite deep. It's yeah. quite deep. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I heard it on uh, a podcast. Somebody said every song is every time the song plays, I cry. So I was like, oh, I got to check that out. Yeah. Like. Uh, I, I, I need more songs like that, and that one just ended up being the one for me that uh, I don't I don't know if I've listened to it and not cried yet. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> like, if you really listen to the lyrics and whatnot, yeah. it's like it, it could it could bring you wow. there. It's a good recommendation. There you go, another one. Yeah. And then after that, we kind of had a second playlist that everyone gave me like a upbeat dance along sort of, kind right, of song. Right, right, yeah, yeah. And so we went into that, and like so it started at this most awkward like moment at the beginning, uh -huh. and we went to this like it built through the evening into that like second playlist of positive and, and yeah. buzzing because you kind of like purged because it's one, one of the things that i i believe strongly that once i heard it and i've experimented it, it feels true is 
the same channel that brings positive emotions is the same one that brings negative emotions or that stores it. Mm. And so, so when we don't allow the negative emotions to be expressed, we don't allow the positive emotions either. Yeah. So when we unblock the negative emotions, we then allow for positive emotions. Yeah. So it's like you could you, you could only just get to choose. I won't allow the negative, but I'll accept the positive. You can't. Yeah. You don't get that choice with the soul. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. So that's why it was like, for me, the the theory behind the emotional disco was like, well, work. And there was no expectation for anyone to feel anything, right? But if yeah, people sure. felt something. They might have do a little bit of unblocking of some negative and then, uh -huh. then there's more room for the positive and it, and it, it ended with like we all ended up in the dark just omming were you there for yeah. that yeah. yeah from nowhere uh -huh. like the music ended and then we just sat in silence just like absorbing the end of the thing and yeah. then the nom started and it just went for like 10 15 minutes just yeah. non-stop yeah and a lot of people said that was the highlight of the thing because uh -huh. it was so organic and it was like, pretty powerful. for me, it was like God's voice ending. Not that it's mm. the voice of God, but that it's like compared to a song, it's like, what song do you end mm. this disco with? But there was nothing better than the human vocal. Yeah. And, and I actually have played in the past with arming at the start of a session and arming at the end of a, se a training session, physical training session. Oh, okay. And noticing how much more harmonious the arm is uh, when the body's open, yeah, right? Yeah. Then at the start, your voice might crack and you're not, your yeah. chest is... But when you're training, you're breathing, whatever. Yeah. And so I like an arm at the end of a session. And I'd forgotten I'd like that. And then it happened naturally. And then it just happened naturally. And then it was just a cool, uh, like... So if someone's into that, maybe, and you've got the space or you don't yeah. feel self-conscious, try an arm before you physically train and try one afterwards. Yeah. And just uh, see if there's a difference. And yeah. See, you know, it's a yeah. But it, yeah, I really liked what you said there, though, about, like, I... For, for me, like, what, if I have a nice session of, of releasing some emotions, then it's like I definitely feel... Maybe not right away, but a little bit later in the day. Mm. I'm more like I'm more open to maybe like a song comes on, and I'll just find myself kind of like dancing a little bit more, <laughs> singing all along a little bit mm. more. It's like yeah. it's like that joy comes through just just for life effortlessly. And effortlessly, yeah. you feel a bit more like a child, and yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's yeah. that old I don't know if Paul Czech talks about it or something. It's like the, the old medicine. Man, like in the old, I don't know if it's the Indians or something, and that like if you go to them with an illness and they ask you like, when did you last dance or when uh, did you, or when did you stop dancing, when did you stop singing? Yeah. And those are like that something happened in that time that like yeah. So when you notice yourself, you are dancing, you are singing. Yeah. You're naturally. You're naturally raising. You're raising, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, well, I feel like on that note, I feel like, shall we go over we, play? We've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. Go over what? Go and play. I don't know if you oh, anything, anything else you yeah, want to cover. In the, in no, the, no. Let's just go move, man. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Cool. All right. <laughs> really great <laughs> to meet you in person, man. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Honestly, man, like, I, I it's, it's quite lonely in this industry or, like, mm, yeah. and because of the online stuff, but, like, to actually connect with a person who's similar, to, you know, maybe it's we're both in the same addictions of, like, <laughs> we have a, I don't know, addiction is probably too extreme and harsh a word. I think we are, like, on this journey and we're, trying to help people and trying to understand the body and yeah. trying to share a message and trying to work on ourselves. And yeah. so it's just been, I think, yeah, almost like a, a blessing from God to meet you. Like, you know, I feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And no, I've, I've, I've really loved connecting and, um, mm. and yeah, I feel, I feel, just feel a lot of connection with you like mm. right off the bat. Right. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I think like we're both figuring out, why we're doing what we're doing yeah and like that's really important questioning everything uh -huh. in a healthy way uh -huh. and not uh, yeah yeah cool man cool right, let's move let's do it yeah <laughs> <laughs>